Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us for to Platforms for Harm, a partnership between Friends of Canadian Broadcasting and the Center for International Governance Innovation, also known as CG. Uh, my name is Andrea Harding and I'm the Community Relations and Events Manager here at CG. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, CG is a nonpartisan public policy research institute often referred to as a think tank that seeks to build bridges from knowledge to power by conducting world leading research and analysis to offer innovative policy solutions. Friends works to advance Canada's rich culture and the healthy democracy it sustains. They conduct leading edge policy and opinion research on issues affecting Canadian media and related issues. You can visit our websites to learn more about each of these organizations and we're very excited to be partnering with Friends today. I am currently located uh, at the CG building and would like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the neutral Nishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. The Center for International Governance Innovation is situated on the Haldeman Track, the land promised to the six nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. As you are joining us from all over, maybe not even in Canada, I would encourage you to do some research and learn more about the territory on which you live, work, and spend your time and reflect on your use of the land, um, especially for those of us who are settlers on it. So before we begin, I would like to take a moment to introduce today's moderator. The bios for all the speakers and the moderator will be dropped into the chat and we'll be using the Q&A function to take audience questions. So you can follow along on the chat, chat you know, to, for some of the information sharing, but please use the Q&A function to participate or to post your questions. Uh, we have a very full session, but we're gonna do our best to get to as many of them as possible. So now I'd like to introduce Rita. Rita Atritshore is an award-winning journalist. She's a senior business writer and columnist at the Report on Business for the Globe and Mail with expertise in Canadian business, including financial services and telecom. We're very pleased to have her be our moderator today, and I will turn it over to you, Rita. Oh, Rita, you're still muted. All right, COVID times. <laughs> okay, I'm very pleased to be here today and um, that participating in an important discussion um, and looking at solutions to what is really a, a really important problem. I want to introduce our panelists. It's really a great group. I want to start by introducing the Honorable Catherine McKenna, Minister of Infrastructure and Communities and MP of Ottawa Centre. Uh, Ms. McKenna is joining the panel today in an individual capacity to share her firsthand experience with harmful online content. She will not comment on the actions the federal government is taking in this area per an agreement between her office and the event organizers, CG and Friends. Next, we have Daniel Bernhardt. He is Executive Director and Spokesperson for Friends. And then we have Taylor Owen. He's a CG fellow, senior fellow. He is the Beaver Brook Chair in Media, Ethics, Communications, and Director of the Center for Media, Technology, and Democracy at the Max Bell School of Public Policy at McGill University, where he is also an Associate Professor. Heidi Tuarek is an Associate Professor of International History, Public Policy at the University of British Columbia. A reminder to the audience uh, to input your questions in the Q&A function throughout the conversation today. And we will do our very best to address as many questions that you have as possible at the end of our discussion. I want to turn over the discussion at this point to Daniel Bernhard to kind of lay the table uh, a bit by talking about the uh, Platforms for Harms research paper that came out today. So Daniel, please take a few minutes to give us some of the highlights. Thank you very much, uh, Rita, and thanks to all of you for, uh, for attending uh, and to the panelists as well for participating in the discussion. I'll be very brief. Friends is releasing today, as you mentioned, Rita, a new piece of research called Platform for Harm. Uh, you can go to friends.ca to uh, check out the research and the briefing materials uh, related to it. Essentially, the backstory is that, you know, over the past five years, especially, the world has become increasingly aware of the negative impact of harmful content circulated on social media. Uh, more, that's a general statement. And in specific, um, how certain companies, I would say Facebook in particular, have demonstrated dubious um, ethical standards when it comes to dealing with this harmful content, which happens to also be uh, very profitable. Now, um, 
I think we all agree that this content is odious, but the point of the research is that actually some of it might be illegal and uh, that the illegality may be not just on the part of the people posting the content, but also on the part of the platforms who are spreading it and disseminating it. And so that's the nature of the argument that we uh, make here. And so while the Justice Committee and others, for example, are considering new laws uh, around online hate and new definitions around online hate. This research suggests that actually existing laws in Canada are largely well equipped to handle this problem. Not perfectly, they could definitely be improved, but there's a lot that is already illegal about this. So um, for example, just uh, yesterday, the logic reported that uh, Premier Legault's office is uh, ramping up its team to deal with a infusion of a, de a deluge of death threats and other um, attacks on the Premier. Death threats are illegal and retransmitting a death threat is also um, illegal. Um, Minister McKenna has had her office vandalized repeatedly and has been personally threatened on many occasions. Um, and that doesn't even begin to talk about things like uh, retransmitting the Christchurch video, for example, which as far as I'm concerned, um, looks a lot like the definition of a, of a, of a hate crime itself. Um, so the, the basic reasoning behind this paper, and it's not going to be the subject of the discussion necessarily, but I'd just like to put it on the table. In Canadian law, when somebody says something that's illegal, whether it's defamation or hate speech, they are obviously responsible, but the publisher or amplifier of the content is also responsible. And that is determined under uh, two criteria. One is the obvious one, which is they're notified about it after they're published and they refuse to take it down. This is the case um, for many social media companies who all have complaints process of one type or another. And as we saw recently with the Kenosha uh, shootings in Wisconsin, um, Facebook was notified of an event that was asking vigilantes to bring guns to a counter protest. Uh, they received over 455 complaints four separate content moderators decided that there was nothing to see here and that the content should stay up. A 17 year old man responded to the invitation, showed up, killed two people and wounded a third. Um, but there is a second um, aspect, which is also interesting, which is about platforms that know that content is illegal or likely illegal and then decide to transmit it anyways. And this is an area where I think um, more attention needs to be paid. The social media companies, by their own admission, when they are speaking to regulators, but also to advertisers, claim to have a very detailed knowledge of what people are posting. Um, Mark Zuckerberg has claimed under oath that Facebook takes down 99% of terrorist content before a human user ever sees it. 89% um, of hate speech supposedly comes down before a human ever sees it. Neglecting the fact that, you know, if a car company told you that the seatbelts only work nine out of 10 times, you'd be outraged. You know, this is an admission that between the time that a user clicks post and the time that that content becomes visible, clearly there is some software that is doing an analysis to say, should we publish or should we not publish? And the content that gets through, therefore has passed that check. Even if the check is, is, is poor, um, that looks like an editorial discretion, um, which would uh, signal liability. And so we're hoping that uh, MPs, police, judges, prosecutors, should take a look at this paper to look at how the platforms actually work by their own admission um, and to evaluate our claim that uh, actually this constitutes advanced knowledge. I would just say one last thing, which is people often say, well, what about free expression? What about the risk of cracking down too much? On this, I would add two points. The first point is that the facts suggest that this so-called, you know, this free for all actually limits free expression. It does not increase free expression. Why? Because people see Minister McKenna's office getting vandalized and all the death threats and all the things that come to her and they say, why on earth would I get involved in public life if I have to endure that? And so actually it's marginalizing people and we can see that um, women, uh, people of color, um, non-cis people are way disproportionately the targets of this. And the evidence suggests that many have self-censored and have restrained themselves from participating in public speech as a result. The second point that I would raise though, is that this is already illegal. And our approach, and the reason why we are proposing this approach is that just as it always has been, a judge will decide. We don't suggest that an MP or a bureaucrat or a politician go in and say what can stay up or what can come down, but that a judge can decide. However, if a judge finds that the content is illegal and that a platform has amplified it, that the platform should be held responsible 
And not only that, but that the penalties should be commensurate to their revenue and size so that it hurts accordingly. And so we're calling on Parliament not to intervene politically, but to simply clarify that these platforms are publishers, that they are recommending this content, not just republishing it or posting it, and that if they are found if a judge finds that they're disseminating harmful content or illegal content, that the, the penalty should be commensurate. So that's the nature of the research. And I'm looking forward to this discussion, which can stray from the research for sure, um, to talk about the contours of this issue and what Canada can do to get a grip on this problem. Thank you for that um, really uh, important outline of the paper. I thought the paper was great. Um, I want to bring in uh, Taylor at this point. Uh, to just add to your comments about what is harmful com content. Specifically, where do we draw the line between objectionable and illegal content? And most importantly, who decides? So Taylor, over to you. Thanks so much. Um, I'm not sure I'm the best person to draw that line, um, in part because right now that line is defined by law, as Daniel pointed out, right? There's, we have very clear, relatively clear and precedent around it, definitions of what is hate speech in Canadian law. Um, the question that I think is far more difficult here is what do we do with all this content that sits adjacent to that? What do we do with the online bullying where it, one individual piece of content might not be illegal, but the cumulative effect can cause significant harm to an individual. What about taunts to, for people to commit suicide? What about um, uh, trolling behavior that shuts down the voices of some people's society and not others? Um, most of these things sit outside of the bounds of what we would call illegal, um, but they're clearly causing a problem. And I think the bigger question we have to get at here is, is there something particular about the nature of our digital technologies and the platforms that Daniel described and the nature of how they're designed and how they function that make that kind of problem worse? We've always had bullying and taunting. We've always had abuse in pe of people in public life. But is there something about the design and how these companies function and are incentivized that make the problem worse and demand a different type of policy response? than we've done in the past. Um, I think Daniel's made a persuasive case that there is, um, and I hope we talk more a bit more about like what those incentives look like, what that those design decisions are that actually, I believe, create this problem in a new way and demands a new policy approach to it. Heidi, I wanna bring you in um, just to build on uh, what Taylor's saying, but also uh, for you, you know, what is <laughs> Yeah, so I think um, Taylor and Daniel quite rightly pointed out that there's a long history of legal debates on, on what is hate speech. And, and we see that this is not just a debate, very importantly, in, in Canada, but this is a debate that's actually currently happening worldwide. And it's a real question amongst, let's just take democracies, as to how you actually deal with this. One of the first examples that we saw was in Germany, where German politicians said in 2017, their approach would be they wanted platforms to enforce 22 statutes of German speech law online. So they wanted the platforms that had over 2 million unique users to deal with any complaints within uh, 24 hours. And this was then enforced by German law, something called NetzDG, or if you want the full German compound noun, the Netzwerk Durchsetzungsgesetz. Uh, and if you're lucky, I'll test you at the end as to whether you can pronounce it. Um, but this is, you know, very much a, an approach that says, We've already got speech law. The problem with the platforms is that it needs to be enforced online. Um, and yet we continue to see uh, problems within Germany, which I think speaks to Taylor's bigger point that this is not just perhaps a case of simply enforcing law that already exists on the books, but thinking more holistically about what is new about these platforms, what is new about their algorithmic recommendation systems. Uh, do we need something that accounts for the processes rather than just the individual posts, something that is more holistic. And I think one of the things that, that Canada has is what I'm going to call the second mover advantage. Canada is not the first country to be thinking about this. It's really in this sort of second line uh, where we can look at what other countries like Germany or France or even the UK are attempting and ask whether this makes sense within Canada and what we can do that is also a democratic approach. Okay, uh, Daniel, back to you for a second. I wondered if you wanted to build on your uh, opening comments by talking a bit about who ought to decide 
um, whether something is harmful content? Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, the short answer, in my opinion, is a judge. And that's been the, the, the case, I think, for a while. Taylor's point, though, um, I think is, is really important. You know, that the, 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 the content that is adjacent to illegal is obviously the most difficult, these edge cases. And I, I would respond to that by saying, you know, that's always been the case. It's been the case with newspapers. It's been the case with broadcasters. But penalties, strong penalties for the egregious violations create an incentive for people to be careful where the edge cases occur. And I'll, I'll give you an example. I submitted an op-ed to the, to the Globe and Mail a couple of weeks ago, which, which ran. And, uh, you know, the Globe editors, there were three editors and a lawyer who read the piece, and there were a couple parts of it that they were uncomfortable publishing. Um, that wasn't censorship. That wasn't some kind of draconian act. It was them being careful about their responsibility for things that could be that in their mind on the edge. And so the, the, the harsh penalties for the extreme cases, I think, can create incentives for people to mind the, the edge cases, because actually that's where the, 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 the risk primarily lies. And we can talk about the design of this content, but all I'll say is one thing that I saw this morning, uh, which is a 2018 post from Mark Zuckerberg, which is a graph, it's really interesting, that basically says the engagement with these posts goes up as the content becomes you know, more and more edgy and increases past the line of where they call prohibited. And so these platforms understand and have made public statements that they make more money when people post things that are egregious, bordering on illegal. And so if this is not knowledge of the problem or complicity in the problem, I really don't know what is. And the UK is promising measures that are not only hold the companies liable, but also the individual executives personally liable when they are involved in this behavior. So I think we can deal with the, the edge cases by coming down appropriately hard on the, on the clear violations. Okay, excellent. Um, the next thing I want us to discuss is, you know, this Platforms for Harm research paper makes the argument that recommending harmful content could be illegal in Canada, but may not be illegal in other jurisdictions like the United States where these platforms are ultimately governed and based. You know, what do we do? What are the barriers stopping us from getting a handle on this problem? And at this point, um, I'd like to bring in uh, Minister McKenna. Uh, could you speak a little bit about your own personal experience uh, dealing with this? I mean, what would have helped you or what do you find helps you? Because uh, this is an ongoing problem that you face. Well, I, look, I think this is a really timely discussion. Um, it's not really about me. Um, it's about, you know, politicians. It's also about our democracy. Um, that, you know, we, we need to be making sure that, of course, that we, you know, free expression um, is incredibly important, but hate speech is not free expression. And there are uh, limits um, in our constitution. There are limits um, under criminal law. We also um, have human rights law. And in terms of my experience, I mean, I'll, I'll personalize it for the sake of generalizing it. Um, I mean, when I started this job, I mean, it was, it was almost instantaneous. Um, I was Minister of Environment and Climate Change, and who knew uh, there are people who don't believe in climate change who are also uh, misogynists. Um, that, was, that was kind of news to me. Um, and uh, it started with, you know, some posts um, that were under a particular hashtag. And I, I just had an analysis done that there's 110,000 violent, abusive, abusive, or hateful posts on my Facebook. Now you can get into what exactly, you know, what does that, what, you know, how do we define that? Um, but I, I think that the, and, and I mean, I can give you examples how, you know, this abuse that, that happens online actually goes offline. So I saw this many, many times. I met with my kids. People are using the same language uh, that they are using online, the same words I'm known as you know, I think it's really irritating, but I, you know, as my daughter said, Barbie is on the moon. Um, I'm named Climate Barbie. So you can do a search that way, but people use the same language offline. Um, my campaign office was defaced. And actually, interestingly, uh, they use the C word, which I don't need to say, because I'm pretty sure everyone knows it. Um, but uh, the Ottawa police investi are investigating that as a hate crime. And the point of all this, and it's happened across the board, it happens to my, you know, one of my colleagues, Lenore Zan, Zan has had a ton of it. Um, she's in Nova Scotia, Kathleen Wynne saw it, Shannon Phillips, the environment minister, 
um, in Alberta. It's across party lines. Michelle Rempel wears a you know a dress. People like have all these comments on, on this. Um, but it's just interesting. I think one of the really interesting points that's made here. I mean, we can spend a lot of time saying what's against the law. But it's also the what is the what is about these platforms. So let's take what happens to me. So you know I have a conversation with the social media companies and they're very sympathetic. They're like that's terrible. You go through this. I said great. So what are you going to do about it? And they said you know what? Report any incidents to me. I said that is amazing because I could spend every single minute of every day. My whole team could. If you want to know, go right now on any post. Go see what's said. Um, that's not my job. My job is actually doing my job. It's not taking on this mantle of having to call out social media companies or terrible posts. It's actually right now getting things built for Canadians and you know working locally to keep my res residents of Ottawa safe during a pandemic and supporting them economically. That's my job. And so what you see about these social media companies is they're not taking responsibility. These are very smart people, have great faith in their ability to use their, their algorithms to actually take action. And I mean, what happens, and actually, I think everyone should go see Social Dilemma. I have not seen it yet. Um, but it, it makes the point that some of the functionality, like like buttons, have had a really detrimental effect. That we're actually pushing hateful, uh, hateful um, posts to people who like hateful posts about me. And they're making money about it, uh, off it. So the engagement actually, if you, you know, if you like something, they will look at, oh, okay, great. How do we push more of that content? Um, that's just one example. Um, how about the fact that so many people are posting anonymously? And I will take the argument because it was made to me that, you know, there's going to be reasons that people want to post anonymously. I mean, if you're a human rights activist in a particular country, uh, I did, I ran a human rights charity. So I certainly, you know, understand that. But that is all, these things are often used as excuses. You can have tailored solutions, but I mean, I know like, you know, Joe 0539879812, whatever it is, uh, probably not a real person or, you know, it's, it could be a bot or it could be someone else that um, doesn't want to reveal their name. Last example I'll give you, and I, as you can see, I'm telling you this personally because I think it's very important that we understand what is happening. But it's not about me. It is literally about how do we take some action. Um, that uh, when you look at, um, we, we asked, so because I knew I had all these hateful comments, I have a lot of people who are very kind. So they report abusive, hateful, violent comments. And I said, well, I'd just like to know, could you show me, could you give me a report of all the violent, hateful comments that you decided violated your policies and were taken down? And I was told, well, no, because that raises privacy issues. Now, I'm just a regular person, happened to be a lawyer, but I was like, I'm trying to understand what privacy issues, if you post something publicly, you violate the policy. A decision is made that it violates the policy, but you can't share it to me. So maybe we have very smart people on this. <laughs> maybe someone can tell me, like, what is the, why are we, whose rights are we protecting? And in the end, as I said, like, okay, we really have to figure this out because at the end of the day, I have people, most people don't want to engage in my posts. If, if you're a normal person, you get stuck in my posts, the haters line up, they're on you, and then they follow you. And so we're actually, to Daniel's point, we're decreasing free speech and rather than increasing it. And, and I, think, look, there's, I think there's a lot we can do, but to the social media companies themselves, like step up. Like, you know, I don't, I, I'm someone who believes we don't have to regulate everything, but if you can't regulate yourselves, you know what, you will find, and we've seen this in other countries, as Heidi's pointed out, that people, that governments will regulate you. Okay, I mean, there's also a bigger discussion going on now about how companies owe more to society than just uh, maximizing shareholder value, that they have to be active participants um, and uh, help create a healthier society. So that's, that's part of a larger debate on uh, social risk facing companies. So it's a great point. Um, I want to go to Heidi. Uh, Heidi, I wondered if what, you, uh, what your thoughts are on what ought to be done. I know that you talked a little bit about what they've done in Germany and you talked about Canada being this kind of having the second mover advantage and never thought of it that way. Uh, what, what do you think can be done at this point to get a handle on the problem? 
Yeah, so I wanted to, to pick up on, on a couple of things that Minister McKenna said. Uh, the first is this question of what platforms do and don't know, this real sort of asymmetry of information that we're facing. Uh, I've called this in other pieces, the company's desire for agnotology, which is their desire for ignorance. So I think there's a kind of weird thing going on with platforms where they tell us on the one hand how much they know about us, right, in terms of selling things to advertisers and so on and so forth. And yet, on the other hand, when certain questions are asked um, about, for example, how much hate speech there is in, say, Canada, specifically, uh, where are the content moderators located to deal with uh, posts in Canada, for example, we don't get any answers. Um, the same about how the recommendation algorithms function. Do they steer people towards more extreme content? So if they like a hate post against Minister McKenna, are they sent to other more extreme content? So this is what I call agnotology, and this seems to me a space for regulation, which is to say uh, companies need to know when there are things that can be damaging. Another way of thinking about this is a precautionary principle. Uh, we don't let chemicals, medicines, uh, vaccines during a pandemic on the market before we check them. Um, and so the same may be true of the algorithms of the platforms. Um, and this is a question, I think, for, for us to debate. Um, where is the moment where regulation should happen and what type of regulation should there be? So should it be regulation around, for example, uh, transparency to deal with some of the, the issues that Minister McKenna raised? Should there be certain types of content that is available to researchers? So you could imagine a transparency regulator um, that may deal with some of these agnotology problems so that we can then finally have evidence-based policy uh, where we're actually able to make these decisions on the basis of evidence. And I'll just give you one very concrete example. So I was fascinated to hear about uh, Minister McKenna's research into her posts on Facebook because I conducted some research on harassment against political candidates during the last Canadian election in fall uh, 2019. And we were only able to do that on Twitter because that was the platform that enabled us to download uh, all of the tweets directed at all the political candidates. And that wasn't possible for us on Facebook. So we can tell you what happened to all the political candidates on Twitter, but not on Facebook. So that's a kind of base level. And then the second thing I'd say is that I think because these platforms are global, they started out with the idea that there could be global terms of service for content. And yet most countries, including democracies who believe in freedom of expression, have very different views on what freedom of expression means than the United States. So I think a lot of this clash comes from a company vision that they can make global uh, US understandings of freedom of expression and, and Canada and Europe have very different visions of that and where the boundaries for things like hate speech lie. That's, I think, one of the other issues where we need uh, like minded international partners uh, to help us deal with uh, these companies and to help them understand that there are many different ways of approaching democratic freedom of expression that's still based in uh, human rights. Okay, excellent. Daniel, um, what about you? What, I mean, your paper outlines a lot of so potential solutions on what ought to be done. Um, what are your thoughts? Well, um, not to be boring and repetitive, but I, I would say that uh, my first preference is to start with what's already the law, because that can be enforced quickly. Um, and what I would say, you know, uh, Heidi makes a really good point about the companies saying one thing to advertisers about knowing everything about you, um, and then says a whole different thing to regulators um, uh, and claims to know nothing. Actually, you know, one case that's listed in the paper is um, uh, Facebook was sued in Northern Ireland um, for a page that um, put up the names and addresses of people who were released from prison for, um, for, for sex crimes, actually. Um, and uh, one, one guy who was on the list sued them and said, you know, I've done my time. You're sending people to my house. Um, and Facebook said, well, look, we publish 100 billion pieces of content a day. How could we possibly find the needle in the haystack? And, you know, the answer to that, and they, of course, showed no evidence of this. And the answer is, well, needle in the haystack is your core product. You, you, you do customized, personalized interest for people. And even if, if you were ignorant, ignorance is not a defense. And so what I would say is, imagine if there were an airline, I mean, I don't wanna, I don't wanna undermine, like belittle the, the challenge here. This is difficult at this scale. And Taylor, I'm sure is gonna wanna talk about, you know, about scale as a challenge. This is very difficult at this scale, but can you imagine if an airline said, okay, look, it's true, 10% of our flights just crash, but you know, flying is really hard. 
it, it's, it's tough. It's difficult. And I would say, you're right. Flying is hard. I wouldn't know the first thing about keeping a plane in the air. But until you can figure out how to do it safely, you're not selling tickets to people. And so what Facebook is doing, an analogy that I saw, which is really great, they're using all of us like crash test dummies. You know, they're basically saying, we'll just put you in and see what happens as opposed to testing the car first to make sure it's safe. So this is ultimately in my mind, a question of who's in charge. If we already have these laws, we already have these rules. Facebook's competitors would wind up in court for engaging in the exact same activity. Why do we consider this some sort of novel case? Um, ignorance is not a defense. The evidence is very clear. I think that we should start by informing police and prosecutors and judges about how these platforms work and say, actually, it's not so different from things you've already convicted other people for doing, and you should, you should go for it. We can start there. And I think our laws are fairly well equipped um, to deal with some of those cases. That would be where, where I would advise that we, that we look for, for starters. That's a very good point. Maybe there needs to be more lateral thinking about existing laws in Canada and how they can be applied in this situation. Uh, Taylor, I want to bring you in uh, to talk about uh, what are some of these possible solutions uh, to this problem? How do we get a handle on it? You're on mute, Taylor. <laughs> Excellent. Right. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's such a big question because these companies are so big, operate at such global scale and touch so many aspects of our lives and our societies and our economies, right? But there, there, there are many wonderful things that come from them, both socially and economically and politically, and there are many downside risks. And because they're so big and broad and complicated, there isn't one solution to any one of those challenges. Right? And I, I worry a bit sometimes that we overly wait and go straight to what in my view is the most difficult challenge, which is the content moderation challenge. Um, as Daniel said, these companies post a billion pieces, Facebook posts a billion pieces of content a day around the world through their various services. A um, hundred billion. A hundred billion. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And so, so a couple of things. One, the needle in the haystack argument is to a certain degree true because of that scale. The problem is, is because there's not a huge incentive for the company themselves to be finding this potentially edge case content or egregious content in any one market, um, it's offloaded to different actors. So look at in Quebec, it was just talked about in the last few days that the premier's office has 12 people full time just searching Facebook for harmful content that it finds and then reporting it to the company. Um, why, why is a premier's office doing that? Why did journalists take on that role? Very often, Con bad content is found by journalists just searching in the latest conspiracy theory that's out there and seeing how many pieces of content are out there. Researchers do it, right? We, we employ a dozen people full time to monitor huge swaths of social media data looking for bad things and harmful things and studying them. And why is this all being offloaded to the people who aren't making money off the very product, right? So, so I think we can get at some of the harmful speech problem by just making the right incentives for companies to find and locate and pull down this content. And that sits in the category that Daniel's talking about. Um, my bigger challenge though, is that many of these problems are actually rooted in a first cause, which is what the actual incentive structure and design of the, of the, the tools are themselves. And I think looking at the case of some of the content, um, Catherine McKenna's experienced gets at this. That, so just look at, why, how and why thousands of trolls would descend on a piece of content she posts or a conversation about her. Um, and it's not because there are thousands of people all at once thinking some misogynist thing about the minister and all deciding they wanna talk about that at the same time. It's not because of that. It's because one person maybe starts that meme the algorithm sees that that meme is getting attention and getting engagement. The algorithm is very good and the system is very good at finding people who might also agree with that particular perspective. So it gets distributed to them. Um, a group might be formed on Facebook to talk about that meme, which then pulls in more people who might have broadly defined similar antagonistic views of the minister. And all of a sudden you have tens of thousands of people who all think 
a very similar wrong thing together, even though they came at it from totally disparate views. So in that case, it's, it's not the individual acts of speech that are the problem. It's the system that brought those people together and amplified a very particular and pernicious form of speech. And so I think from a policy perspective, you can, really, you can get sucked in this trap of playing whack-a-mole around bad things being said individually when I really want to also put some focus on how do we regulate or oversee the actual incentive structure of the system. And you do that by looking at the way data is used and handled, by the financial overseeing the financial models, by maybe not allowing companies to get so big that scale becomes such a problem, right? So there are other ways we can get at this more structural problem that I think might solve some of the harmful speech problems. Um, then maybe we can start talking about the harmful speech stuff, which is 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 much more complicated and difficult and actually politically very challenging to implement because of the way the debate's being framed around free speech which rightly or wrongly um, is part of the political calculus right now that's a, a great point taylor about not allowing the companies to get so big um, uh, you know that they can't possibly be managed it's that actually makes it an antitrust issue and i don't think i've ever Absolutely. heard anyone really describe it yeah, in that way. Um, so that's, uh, that's a very interesting perspective. Okay, so I want to ask um, before uh, one last question before we get into audience questions. And that is, what are the implications for freedom of expression here? Is there a fundamental conflict conflict between safety and liberty in this instance? You know, a lot of people will talk about cancel culture. Um, and some people fear being canceled, other people fear being killed. So I want to talk to um, uh, Minister McKenna, actually, about this issue. You know, you, you said it really um, aptly at the beginning, you know, hate speech is not freedom of expression. But what do you believe are the implications here for freedom of expression? Uh, so I have a lot to say on the antitrust side because my background is an antitrust lawyer. And, and to be honest, the U.S. and the uh, European Union is, is looking at this, this particular issue. Um, look, I, I, actually, I think Taylor, I mean, I always think Taylor's brilliant, but Taylor uh, made a really good point. I mean, the problem is, of course, you can go into like, you know, a picture of a Barbie that's like smashed, which is actually what someone found or any other terrible thing. And you can go to that piece and say, well, wait a minute, let's go to that. And then it's, it's like literally whack-a-mole. And, you know, the premier has 12 people. Everyone just has teams of people doing this. And, and I think the point on incentives incredibly important but because we have a dearth of information in terms of what's collected how it's collected um how what are they pushing out how are they pushing out how are they mo like how are they um uh, uh monitoring this abuse and how do they take action i mean it's it's extremely complex so we do need much more transparency uh, and the fact that you have multi-ownership uh between different platforms so that you can actually leverage that information um is is important. Like, look, I'm someone who believes in free speech. <laughs> like, actually, as I say, I was, I'm a human rights lawyer. I worked in Indonesia. I worked on a peacekeeping mission. Like, I value this. But this is a fake discussion. I was going to go out there. Like, people say this all the time. Like, oh, gosh, look, there's another politician who wants to limit free speech. No way. I'm all for free speech. The problem is so many, like, hate speech is not that. Abusive comments are not that. Because what it does is it really has the impact of silencing people. You know, I'm not gonna be silenced. Like I know to all those people out there, I'm not, because I am from the hammer, I am Irish, I am in politics because I think it's important to discuss with people and engage. But there are a lot of other people, and reasonably so, that are saying, I don't, how would I do this? And um, this is why I speak out. You know, people say, you know, maybe don't do this discussion. No, I'm doing this discussion because it's so important that you have someone who's in politics who can see the impacts. And by the way, every time I have to go out and have a discussion about this, because um, there's been an incident in my office, which I hate, by the way, um, I hate the incidents, but I hate going out. I have more people come to me. I have so many female politicians, so many racialized politicians, so many women who are thinking about going to politics. I mean, men too, who say to me, like, 
is it that bad? And the reality is it's kind of bad. And so I think we have an obligation to figure it out, but we have to call it out. When people say you're wanting to talk about limits on free speech, that is not what we're talking about. That's a fake discussion. We need to fix the system. And I need to make it so that women and girls out there of you know broad diversity, they want to go into politics, that they'll do it or they won't not do it because they feel like it's a, not a safe space to engage. And if you look at my colleague like Miriam Monsef, the amount of hate she has got because she's a visible minority, that the, that the racist comments that she gets, it is completely unacceptable and appalling. But that also extends to Ahmed Hussein. He's a refugee from Somalia who he worked so hard and made it to be the minister, uh, a minister in our government. And he's got to put up with this garbage. Like, I think we do all have an obligation. And, and look, I'm hoping the social media companies are watching this right now. Because I think we're all saying, like, we don't think you're terrible. In fact, I think your platforms are really important. That they allow a whole range of people to engage in a way they couldn't. But we got a problem. And it's a really big problem, dudes. So let's figure it out. Um, or you're going to pay the price because it will happen. It'll happen through antitrust. It'll happen through, you know, regulatory action. It'll happen. And also probably the biggest thing that they should be worried about is people will be like, why am I on these platforms? Like, why would I bother? And that's the biggest thing they need to worry about because if your business model starts to fail because people don't believe in it, you lose money and your shareholders lose money. So I'm, I'm, look, I'm an optimist in life and I think that we need to have practical discussions. Um, and then we can really make a difference because I, I am getting tired of this and, and these conversations are important, but more important I think is action. And I think Canadians are there. I think people around the world are there. They wanna see serious action because they don't think that this is cool. They don't think it's okay that you go into politics and you take massive amount of abuse online that then jumps offline. I don't think it's cool and I will stand up for this, but you know, we need to figure out, the problem is we have a dearth of information back to what Heidi Daniel Taylor said and we need to really understand that so we can understand what what needs to be done? Is it the like button that's a problem that's pushing hateful content to people so you can jump on and get more hateful content out there? What are the other uh, incentives? Okay, um, that's, uh, these are all great points. Uh, obviously, this has real, um, in some cases, life and death uh, implications for people. Uh, okay, Daniel, uh, you're next. Uh, you know, what do you think the implications are for free speech? I, mean, I think what Minister McKenna has said about um, silencing people, the effect uh, of this abuse, silencing people, doesn't require any further elaboration. I think she's got the point um, perfectly and has expressed it perfectly. Uh, I, what I would like to talk about, though, and, and part of why, you know, our approach that we are proposing on existing laws, part of why I I think it's viable and useful is because it introduces no new changes. It introduces no new restrictions on freedom of speech. And, you know, uh, people of all political parties have not opposed these rules historically. And so one way is to start with the rules that we've all accepted. Um, that's one of the reasons why I think this approach is good. It doesn't take us into a new legislative debate. I, I would disagree, though, um, if I can. There's been a little too much agreement on this panel. So if you, if you don't mind me uh, uh, getting in here. Um, to, you know, to the minister's point about there being a dearth of information, I would just want to add a point, which is that, you know, when there is suspicious activity in any other company, what happens is, is the cops show up, right? And they, they, they raid your office and they seize hard drives and they seize files and they take that information. And in the case of these social media companies, I have not yet seen Canadian authorities behave as though we are the authority. There's a lot of negotiation asking the companies to, to participate voluntarily, but they make billions of dollars here. If they don't want to comply with the law, we do have some leverage over them. So I would say that's one thing. And to Taylor's point about playing whack-a-mole, I agree. This, there, there are systemic incentives here for sure. But, you know, we solve systems through courts in individual cases. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the most famous case in the world, Roe v. Wade, right? Like uh, one person with one case, huge systemic implications after that case is decided. So I'm not suggesting that we should go and play whack-a-mole to solve the problem. What I'm suggesting is, is that some of these individual cases, in my opinion, look like they suggest some serious illegal behavior on the part of the platforms. And if the penalties were severe enough, that would change the systemic incentives. And, and one, of, one of the uh, quotes in the paper, which I think is fantastic, is like, if you go to a library, 
and ask the librarian for a copy of Mein Kampf, you know, the librarian will look at you and, you know, we would expect for, as a matter of free expression and inquiry that they would come and bring you the book. If you ask them for something good to read, though, we would hope that they would recommend something else. And what, you know, what Facebook is doing through these recommendations, like the Wall Street Journal, for example, reported earlier um, in the summer that Facebook's own research showed that more than two thirds of the joins of extremist groups on the platform were the result of their own recommendations, not people seeking it out, but Facebook pushing it to you and saying you would like this. So, you know, NBC estimates that, um, you know, there are three to five million uh, people in QAnon groups. Well, by that um, uh, metric then, Facebook is responsible for two to three million of those joins. The same with the Kenosha um, stuff, the same as Taylor was saying um, about threats to the minister and other people. This is active recommendation. That is called willful promotion. And in certain cases, willful promotion is a term prescribed in criminal law. And so if each one of those infractions cost $100 million, you know, or $200 million, or if a certain number of infractions rob you of your license to operate and sell advertisements, for example, that would change the game. And so when we talk about these systemic incentives, I think one of the few, we can't prescribe how their businesses work. And there are a lot of people who say, don't get too involved. And I say, okay, that's fine. Let's just tell them what the consequence of failure is and then let them figure it out. Um, and if they decide to take things down or adjust accordingly, that's up to them, they're free enterprises. But if they are found on the wrong side of the law or if their business is too big for them to operate legally, that's their problem. All we should do is enforce the penalties. And so hopefully that's a starting point. It's not about whack-a-mole as public policy. It's about changing the incentives through significant fines for violations of laws that we've already existed for a long time and that we've already ag agreed are illegal for hundreds of years of case law. Okay, um, I want to make sure that we have time for uh, audience questions, so I'm going to uh, just pivot here a bit. Uh, here's a question from the audience, and um, maybe Heidi, you, you can answer this one. Uh, might targeting the advertising model be a more effective method of attacking these harms rather than targeting the speech or speakers themselves, especially considering there is a much lower constitutional bar for limiting advertising? And what is your... Uh, perspective given what's happening elsewhere in the world? Yeah, thanks for that question. I mean, I'm glad that we're, we're talking about ads because ultimately then we're getting to the question of the business model, right? What is it, these, com these are companies, they want to make money, what do they make money from? Advertising and increasingly as time has gone on, that has been more and more about targeting advertising, right? So these, the, the Facebook of 2020 is not the Facebook of 2005 and I think that's also a very very important point for us that as time has gone on more and more of what Facebook does and recommends and what it shows us in our feed or Twitter too this is this is true of many platforms uh, is served to us through algorithms uh, something of which the vast majority of people or many people who use the platforms are in fact unaware so I just want to add a couple of um, questions about harms which I think uh, the US has been addressing one is the question of who is served as and whether that violates in the case of US law um, excluding protected categories. And we have seen um, the housing department in the US push back against this question by saying that the way that ads were served, used and violated uh, the idea of serving an ad equally and excluded protected categories. So I think this is a very, very important point that we can think about. How is advertising actually being served in ways that excludes people? So if, for example, an ad is framed through certain types of categories, which means, say, an ad for becoming a scientist or having a scientific position is served more to men than women, well, that can have sort of legal consequences. So this goes to Daniel's point that there's actually within US law even, and we've seen it happen, questions about how ads may be exclusionary and discriminatory. And then we could add into that the question of, of Canadian law as well. So I think there are a lot of people who are thinking about this. Um, also in Europe, uh, thinking through these sorts of questions of antitrust or of how the algorithms operate. And within Canada too, we have ideas of algorithmic impact assessments, uh, which the Canadian government is required to do. And the question would be, is that something that should be extended towards these businesses and perhaps it's solely through uh, the advertising at the beginning, given that that's how the companies make money. So I agree, we shouldn't just think about the individual users posts, but rather the thing that makes companies uh, money <laughs> and whether that's actually being served in a way that is uh, non-discriminatory and adheres to uh, Canadian law. Taylor, I see you nodding your head. Is there something that you would like to add on the um, question of the advertising model? I mean, 
I agree with everything Heidi said there. I mean, it's there. It, I think it points to the ability. So some of these problems, like things like antitrust, probably or some of the policy area domains here, things like antitrust and probably broad global data policies need to be fundamentally international and global um, in nature because the companies are so big that you need enough incentives. Um, you need company countries to band together to create enough of a market incentive for change or enough legislative uh, legislative and regulatory power to force change. Advertising, and I would argue some of the free expression issues are actually a case where domestically, we need to decide this ourselves. Um, and Canada is a good example of that. Leading up to the last election, um, the Canadian government did put some laws in around transparency and political advertising. Laws that might have were probably unconstitutional in the United States um, and probably never would have happened, but they, we were able to do it. We were able to show that providing some transparency in political advertising makes a difference and probably creates a more, an election with more integrity. And now other countries, to use Heidi's comment, have a second mover advantage on that particular type of legislation. So other countries can look to us and say, look, Canada did this. It probably made a bit of a difference in the election and we can too, right? We can make companies be more transparent or leave our markets. Um, free speech, so just go back to this free expression conversation, is another case where Nash, we need to decide this as a country. Um, free speech means something very different in different democracies. Germany banned Nazi speech for very particular reasons. Um, and that's how we should determine free speech. Free speech should be decided collectively within a democracy. And so I think in Canada, we need to have a conversation not about whether our, what the terms of service globally of a platform company should be, or what free speech should look like in the United States or in other illiberal or even in the liberal regimes, we need to decide what we want it to look like here. And so I, I would join in Daniel's call here. And I think the paper does a good job of spurring this conversation of, and I'm also put a nod to this commission for democratic expression that's going on right now that Beverly McLaughlin's chairing and is calling for input from Canadians on um, and I would recommend people to, to participate in that process and put in um, opinions because we need to decide in Canada what we want this to look like um, because it's our speech and it's our democracy. Okay, we have time for just one more quick question from the audience. And I'm gonna um, ask Minister McKenna uh, if she might be able to answer this one. Uh, this one's an interesting one. Don't we have to look for a, a more long-term place to concentrate our efforts? One of the suggestions that the uh, audience member is suggesting is education. I understand education is not uh, a, a federal responsibility and that you're speaking today as an individual, but you know, what are some of the other uh, places that we should be concentrating our efforts on on the long term? Uh, so that's a really good question. Um, like, uh, look, it's interesting young people. So I have, I have three kids. Um, and I mean, they have pretty strong views about social media and, and it's interesting. They're much more sophisticated about it. I think, um, often that, I mean, they think they're more sophisticated maybe, and it's just, you know, they're like, why would I be on Twitter? Like that's just people yelling at each other and like it's fake accounts. And, and so, I mean, I think education is incredibly important, but to all segments of the population, um, it's not just kids. I mean, we know that seniors are, are you know, are, are very active users of social media. And I think we need to have conversations. Um, you, you think about things that happen that people don't even real, realize, like Twitter, uh, I had to apologize because they had an algorithm that was favoring white faces over black faces. Like, do people know that? Do people understand advertising? I mean, I think smart, younger people in some ways are, are, are slightly, are smarter, I think, um, except you know, they've just grown up with this. So privacy is much less of a, a concern with them. Um, look, I, I think that you have to do short-term and long-term things. And I think um, I just wanted to go back uh, and just Daniel made a good point. Uh, I actually think that you can do test cases or you can do, you can, you can take action um, through the courts and that will, you know, if, if you're successful on something big, it can have a huge implication. It's true with precedence. I mean, take the example he gave, the Christchurch massacre. Um, you could just make a decision that, that you're taking that down or you're holding them responsible, like, you know, actually for not taking down the video. 
Um, and then, you know, the chips fall where they may. Like, I'm pretty sure the courts would find that that's a, a reasonably justified that you would take action, free and democratic society. But I, I, I do think, I don't want to diminish that. Um, but I think you got to use a whole range of tools. Well, we got to get a grip on this now because, you know, if we don't, it's just growing and growing as a, as a problem. And, and literally we're seeing that, you know, it's, it's influencing the outcomes of election. It's resulting in, in real violence against real people. Um, it's in, it's in increasing discrimination um, and hate um, and abusive, um, uh, abusive um, actions. So, look, I think that there's a, a lot of different tools. Uh, and as Daniel said, we don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time. We just need to implement them. And then a level of transparency and demanding action um, I think is also uh, is also part of it. And of course, education. I mean, look, I think I don't even know. Like when we talk about all of these different tools and the information these companies have and all of this, um, it's hard to imagine. I remember I was one of those vulnerable people who said, you could see if your face looked like um, some painting or what painting most look like. So I thought, oh, that's kind of funny. This was years and years ago. And then someone's like, oh wait, you're now helping do with facial recognition <laughs> software. And I was like, oh God. Um, so, you know, we're all, we're all susceptible and, uh, you know, people are, these companies are pretty savvy uh, and they're making, you know, bazillions of dollars off of us. So, you know, I think that we can figure this out. Great. I want to thank you all for your insights today. I mean, uh, this has been a really important discussion because not only have you all challenged uh, us to think about who actually is a publisher of, of this type of content, it's also kind of a revelation that, you know, perhaps our existing laws uh, that we already have in place just need to be enforced in such a way, or there needs to be, as I said earlier, more lateral thinking about how we enforce current laws uh, to tackle the problem. And perhaps we need to pay more attention uh, to us to the point that all of you have made about the financial incentives uh, that these companies have uh, for pushing out this content uh, and that the role that they play in propagating it uh, and sending it out to users. It's uh, a really important discussion and I really do hope that um, as a country we can learn from uh, what has gone on elsewhere and uh, that second mover advantage that Heidi talked about um, really implementing it and you know, coming up with some practical solutions. I want to um, turn the discussion back over to Andrea at this point. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rita. Um, and thank you to all our speakers and all of you for attending today. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time. I, and I know there were so many unanswered questions. I think we probably could have talked about this all afternoon or probably all day. So I appreciate you joining us for this. And I encourage you to fr visit friends.ca to see the full report if you haven't already. Check out cgonline.org slash events or subscribe to our newsletter to stay up to date on CG research and events. As Taylor mentioned, there's some work we're doing on this uh, through CG as well. And I'm sure there'll be more discussions on this topic soon. So thank you again. For, to everyone for attending and I hope you have a good day. <laughs>